I'm going to talk about the Citicorp Center today because it's a really interesting tale about how a civil engineering student called out a major design flaw in an existing New York skyscraper. And you've probably heard this story many times before. I've seen many videos on this personally. But what all these videos don't really do is go into the interesting engineering analysis that goes into the skyscraper. And I mean, Diane Hartley, the student who discovered it, was a student at the time. So the math is actually very approachable. So I'm going to try and talk about it. If you're new to the channel, my name is Matt. I'm in structural engineering and I've been making videos about like bridges and buildings for a while on TikTok and Instagram, but I thought I would do a longer form video about the Citicorp Center because there's a lot to actually get into in terms of the math. I want to go through and actually show some of the calculations done by the student Diane Hartley and the engineer William J. LeMessure because it's a very approachable way to look at the structural response due to the impact of the wind. Um, so if you like cool engineering stories like this, also like and comment and let me know and subscribe for more videos like this. Um, okay, so I'm going to get started. The story of the Citicorp Center begins in the 1970s with structural engineer William J. LeMessure and he was sketching out the structural system on a napkin sketch because structural engineers and architects love a napkin sketch for some reason. And he was going through the site conditions because on the northwest corner there was a church that was going to be continuing use on that site. So instead of having the columns on each of the corners of the building, he shifted them inward so that each column was at the midpoint of each face. This resulted in the corners cantilevering out from the midpoint 72 feet over the plaza. And to handle this, he used an innovative use of a chevron brace, which is where the braces come and form a V in the middle. And he used these braces to basically funnel all the forces down to these midpoint columns. The building was designed based off of the 1960s New York City building code, which meant that it had to resist only perpendicular winds. This meant that in each direction, the wind was coming head on to the building and not at any other angle because this was assumed to be the worst case wind load. And this also meant that because these chevron braces covered each face of the building, that they also acted to brace the building against the wind. If we analyze the chevron brace on a single level in 2D, assuming that the corners will take the compression and tension, and the center will only resist the horizontal force, we can see that the windward diagonal is put into compression and the leeward diagonal is then in tension. Similarly, we can see that the windward corners are in tension and the leeward corners are in compression. The horizontal force transmitted to the floor below is equal to the wind force at this level, while the compression and tension forces are dependent on the aspect ratio of the story. This is calculated by balancing the forces and moments about the center support. If you're not familiar with structural engineering, you can think of balancing the forces as kind of like a seesaw or a lever, where you want them all balanced about the fulcrum, which I have as the center support. So what you want to do is look at the lever arm, which is the distance that each force is acting away from this fulcrum, and then you multiply the force by the distance, and then you can balance it all out so everything is in equilibrium. Now let's look at what happens in 3D, specifically at the bottom where we have our unique column placement. If we apply the perpendicular wind forces on each side of the frame, the side braces activate as we had before. Now if we look at the support conditions, if we balance the system about the center, we're going to want this leeward column in the back to be pushing up in compression, and we're going to want the windward column here acting in tension. If we look at these cantilevering corners, all the members come in and meet at right angles, which means that it's impossible to transfer axial force from one to another. So these are going to be zero force members and can't be taking any of the load. This leaves only the braces here in the back capable of holding up the side braces in compression, which results in the back braces acting in compression, which funnel down to that midpoint column, and then this horizontal member up here is tying them together in tension. The same pattern is also repeated on the windward side of the building, but the compressive and tensile members are flipped. This was the innovative way that these chevron braces were capable of transferring the wind loads because you have them moving them down the sides of the building in terms of the horizontal force, but then when they need to meet at the columns in the back, you have the forces wrapping around both the back side of the building and the front side of the building. And this whole system of how the wind load travels down the building is what's known as a lateral force resisting system in structural engineering. So this all seemed fine. There was a load path for the wind to get down to the columns, it activated a lot of the building, but it all seemed to work out pretty well. But things got messy in 1978 when William LeMessure got a call from a civil engineering student in New Jersey. And they were saying that they were studying the tower for their class and specifically they had asked about the column placement because they wanted to know about its resistance to quartering winds. Now you'll recall from the 1960s building code, you had the perpendicular winds hitting each face of the building head on, but a quartering wind is when the wind comes onto the building at a diagonal, so hitting the corners of the building. LeMessure told the student that the columns were placed in the strongest position to resist these, and that was the end of that. But the question did pique his interest, since the 1960s building code did not require this quartering wind analysis, so he ended up going back and checked over some of his calculations just as an exercise. So to see the impact of these winds, I'm going to apply the quartering winds diagonally at an angle of 45 degrees, and we can see that the total surface area resisting the wind is larger by approximately 40%, or a factor of the square root of 2. Balancing the building about the center here means that there's also a shorter lever arm between the columns because they're not placed at the corners. 
and this results in the compression and tension forces to increase. However, because now we have two columns resisting this on each side, the magnitude of force per column remains the same. The difference is instead of having only two columns taking this force, we now have all four columns activated at the same time and the same magnitude. And since we saw how a single story wind load activates the entire structure, there's reason to suspect that all these superimposing load paths could lead to some concerning increases. So seeing this, LeMessure redid his calculations for the braces, and we're going to do that right now. So I'm going to take this total wind force and divide it into two components, one that acts along each perpendicular face of the building. The resulting loads on each face are equivalent to the individual perpendicular wind load cases from the building code, but this time instead of analyzing them separately, we have to analyze them together. So we're going to superimpose the resulting forces on top of each other. When we add both of these results together, where we have compression in one direction and tension in the other direction, these forces are going to cancel out. Then when we have compression in both cases or tension in both cases, we're going to say these forces double. So if we add these two together, we can look at the final force diagram on the right, and it's showing that the windward and leeward columns are getting a reduction in force, but the side corners are getting double the force. Now LeMessure was reassured that the member size of the braces was fine and this increase could be taken, but a member is only as strong as its connections. If we look at the scale of the Citicorp Center, each brace is a number of stories tall, which is impossible to fabricate in one piece. So it was forged in a series of smaller sections that were stitched together with full penetration welds. However, LeMessure then found out that these welds were later replaced by a bolted connection, because welding was generally slower and it was harder to find good welders, and overall it just meant the cost would increase a lot. But if you have bolted connections, they were fast, easy, and they kept the overall cost down. So subcontractors were much more incentivized to favor those in a design. But the structural difference is the full penetration weld gives you roughly the full member strength across the seam, while a bolted connection strength only relies on the number of bolts. So if you take your transfer force divided by the individual bolt strength, you get the number of bolts that are necessary for the force, which is not necessarily equal to the full possible member capacity. So the steel contractor had the individual forces needed for the splice connection due to each of these wind directions, but they probably did not think to add them together, so these bolted connections were insufficient for this quartering wind load case. And on top of that, LeMessure also went through the safety factors and load factors used and found another error. For everyone unfamiliar, when structural engineers are designing a building, material strengths are multiplied by a factor of safety that reduces its calculated strength. And then similarly, we also take the estimated loading and multiply it by a factor to overestimate how much we expect the structure to face. For example, a load combination might multiply the dead load by 1.2 and multiply the live load by 1.6, then reduce the calculated strength by about 10%. By reducing the strength and increasing the load, you can conservatively design the structure with a comfortable level of confidence. This specific method I showed is called Load and Resistance Factor Design, or LRFD. There's also the Allowable Strength Design, or ASD, but I have personally only encountered LRFD designs in my work. Anyways, this is important because LeMessure also learned that his engineers decided to change the load combination used for the braces. For columns in tension, there's a load combination where you take the tension due to the wind force and subtract out 75% of the compression from the dead load. But his engineers were arguing that the braces functionally acted more like diagonals in a truss, so that load combination could be ignored and the full dead load could be subtracted out. As LeMessure gave in an example, if you take 1600 kips of dead load compression and subtract out 2000 kips of wind load tension, no load factors gives you a design force of 400 kips, while the factor design force gives you a force of 800 kips. And if you design a bolted connection based off of this, you might prescribe 4 bolts when it really needs 8. So now LeMessure was sitting with a doubling of the tension force due to the quartering winds, weaker bolt connections that don't fully utilize the member strength, and a less conservative approach for estimating these forces. He had some reassurance in the fact that the Citicorp Center had a tune mass damper. The tune mass damper was designed as a large concrete block with springs on either side that could mechanically move the mass according to the movements of the wind. This reduced the building sway to a comfortable level without the need for additional steel, and also had dynamic effects in reducing the forces that were imposed on the building from the wind. With these new concerns, LeMessure went to the wind tunnel engineers in Canada, who had worked on the building previously, and they told him the reality of the wind results were even worse than he calculated. Due to some peculiarity with the dynamic response of the building, the forces went up a lot more than he thought. But this also pointed out another design flaw where a storm could easily knock out the power and cripple the building's tuned mass damper, resulting in more sensitivity to the storm's winds, and this changed the overall likelihood to a possible 16-year storm knocking down the building, which was uncomfortably short. So LeMessure called up lawyers, architects, insurers, bankers, and other engineers, and the situation was assessed and confirmed, and the team went into the building and welded plates over the bolted connections, kind of like a band-aid. They just 
put it on and then welded them to the side. And this helped the braces utilize their full strength and at least compensate for the quartering wind increases. Luckily for LeMessure, there was a newspaper strike going on at the time, so the story didn't get out right away, but eventually the story was told years later. The student who called and raised the concern was later revealed to be Diane Hartley when she saw coverage of the story on the news and realized it was her. Diane had been a student at Princeton and had called the office and spoke with a junior staffer about the matter briefly. She didn't realize that her inquiry eventually led to this entire saga playing out, and it's a really good example of how your curiosity of an engineer can have really intense real-world consequences. If you'd like to read more about the story, the article was originally published in The New Yorker, and you can still read it today online. And you can also go back to one of the sources that I watched, which was LeMessure's lecture at the National Academy of Engineering about the matter. If you like this video, please like and comment and let me know, and subscribe for future videos for more deep dives in engineering like this. Thanks for watching.